Dobré odpoledne, dámy a pánové. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Let me welcome you all on the premises of the Severo Institute. For those of you who are, who are here for the first time, it's, this is a private university. It has existed for six years. So we already have our first bachelor's as well as our first master degrees. We do political science, private law as well as public law. We also offer other activities such as conferences, also international. We also have accredited as well as non-accredited diplomas and degrees for managers in public sector. Our school also expands in the field of publication. We have an edition with a publishing, you know, publishing house, Severn Institute Publishing Press. We also were, are engaged in the research, we have an, an agreement for a research center with the Masaryk Institute and the Science Institute. We also cooperate with foreign institutions. We have foreign professors. This is the case also today. Our students also go abroad. In short, we are a University who tries to have its place in the field of uh, my university is in the Czech Republic. This we have the occasion to meet here at the conference to pay or not to pay with the euro analysis of the countries within and outside the eurozone. We have four speakers here who will talk about this topic. The first one. I'd like to welcome the first Mr. Philip Bagus from the Juan Carlos University in Spain, which is a partner school to our school. And uh, currently we have our students at this university in Spain. We also have here a distinguished guest from the Czech Republic, Vice Governor of the Czech National Bank, Dr. Moimir Hampel. We also have two guests. One of them is uh, Dr. Rybacek from the macroeconomic section from the Czech Statistical Office, who has been working, who has produced an article about this topic. And the last but not least, uh, the fourth speaker is. Uh, faculty from our school, Mr. Pavel Menarek. What the conference will look like? First, we will have four short lectures or speeches. We will have the authors of the articles or analysis and then the Vice Chancellor of the Czech National Bank will present his speech, a short speech on his own attitude. He'll also comment on what has been said. Our conference will also be available on the internet in real time. It will be available on Twitter, and today's conference will also be a place where we will be happy to have a feedback on ideas that you'll have the opportunity to hear here, because all the four speeches will be published in a bilingual publication in Czech as well as in English. It will be the first book of about 120 pages 
as a part of a new edition of our school. In other words, today we not only have interesting guests and an interesting topic, but we also have a new project, which I hope will be put into life this way. And every three months or so, we would like to publish a similar book about topical articles on what's going on in our society, either in the field of economy or politics. This is all from me. I'd like to welcome you again here. And I'd like to ask to join the floor. For I would like to ask Philip Bagus. I'd like to show the two books of his. The tragedy. One of them is the tragedy of the euro. We have it in Slovak here as well as in English. The book is a kind of a bestseller. It has been translated uh, over a very short time into dozens of languages. And the other book that is available for sale here is uh, the, the other book by Dr. Bagus on this is the first analysis of economical problems in Iceland. Both books are available here and the author will certainly be happy to sign them. I'd like to wish all the best to the conference. This shouldn't take more than uh, two hours, about 75 minutes of the lectures and then a discussion with the participation of at least some of you. Philip, the floor is yours. Dobré odpoledne všem. Nejdříve bych chtěl poděkovat Josefu Šímovi za to, že mě jsem pozval do Prahy. Já jsem tady žil asi čtyř nebo pět měsíců a jsem velice rád, že jsem tady v tom nádherném městě znovu, i když je velká zima v těchto dnech. Budu mluvit o tom, jak, jaký má vliv euro na konkurenceschopnost. Nemůže být udržený růst, když nebude ekonomika konkurenceschopná. Myšlenka za eurem byla to, že euro a Evropská unie, s eurem Evropská unie bude konkurenceschopnější vůči Spojeným státům a dalším velkým činitelům na světovém ve světovém hospodářství. Nicméně v tomto ohledu vidíme, že to bylo naprostý neúspěch s eurem, protože ta konkurenceschopnost rozhodně není taková, jako by měla být minimálně v Jižní Evropě. Ve skutečnosti loni v květnu to by, jsme měli Europlus pakt, který řešil tento nedostatek konkurenceschopnosti. Také máme daňový pakt, který byl zahájen nedávno. Ukážu vám, že tento vývoj konkurenceschopnosti není náhodný. Ne, má to nic společného s leností v středomorských zemích. Je to zkrátka to, jak je nastaveno, je to dalno tím, jak je nastaveno euro. Jak jsem napsal v vese knize, jedná se o tragédii obecní pastviny. Jedná se o společně sdílený a vlastněný zdroj, který využívá několik uh, uživatelů. Vede to k přílišnému vyčerpání toho zdroje, protože náklady se externalizují na další uživatele. Je to stejné jako s rybáři v oceánu. Každý může rybařit a nachytat, kolik chce ryb, protože když je nevychytají, tak je vychytají jiné, jiní rybáři. Je to tedy přečerpání zdrojů a říká se tomu tragédie obecní pastviny. S eurem je to to samé. Je, jeden zdroj, je to jeden zdroj, který může čerpat několik zdrojů. Jsou to uživatelé eura. 
A tady je mechanismus, jakým to funguje. Vlády většinou utrácejí víc, než získají na daních. A když vznikne rozdíl, tak vytisknou další vládní dluhopisy a ty prodávají do bank. Bankovní systém v eurozóně může používat tyto dluhopisy a používat tyto dluhopisy v Evropské ústřední bance jako zajištění dalších půjček, čímž se zvyšuje, zvyšují úvěry a oběživo a stoupají ceny. Tímto způsobem mohou být deficity monetizovány poté se musí platit to není nic zvláštního samo o sobě, protože to samé se děje i ve Fedu, tam se to platí přímo. Ale co je zvláštní, je, že nejenom jedna vláda to může udělat v eurozóně, ale mohou to udělat, může to udělat více vlád. To tím se to liší od federální banky ve Spojených státech a výsledkem je tedy tragédie obecní pastviny. Také zde máme jakési pobítky e, jít do deficitu. Může to udělat kterákoliv vláda. Daně jsou e, nepopulární, tak se tisknou vládní dluhopi, dluhopisy. A další banky kupují tyto dluhopisy a poté používají tyto dluhopisy, aby získali další půjčky od e, Evropské banky. Pak se může poskytovat více půjček a zase stoupají ceny. Ale to nejenom v těch zemích, kde jsou deficity, ale dříve či později se tak děje v celé eurozóně. Takže tento jde potom o přerozdělení jak deficitů. První, kdo získá peníze, si může ještě koupit za staré ceny, ale ten poslední už má ceny zvýšené. tak to lze externalizovat svoje deficity na další země, jak na další státy v eurozóně, tak na další země mimo eurozónu. Je zajímavé, že, vlády, že zde vyhrávají ty vlády s nejvyšším deficitem. Například Německo by mělo 3% deficit a zbytek eurozóny by měl 10% deficit HDP, pak by stouply ceny například průběžně, průměrně o 8%, to by znamenalo, že i když Něme, Německo mělo deficit, jejich skutečné náklady, samozřejmě ceny stoupají více, než byly jejich deficit, takže zisk a prospěch z toho mohou mít pouze ty země, které mají vyšší deficit než ostatní země. Je to tedy pobítka k tomu mít vyšší deficit. Je to jako, když se tisknou eura, kdo tiskne víc, má víc peněz. Samozřejmě, že jsou zde jisté rozdíly s tím příkladem s tiskánami na peníze, protože vlády samozřejmě nemohou tisknout eura přímo. To jediné, co mohou udělat, je tisknout si své dluhopisy, vládní dluhopisy a vlanky, banky musí tyto dluhopisy koupit a Evropská banka je musí přijmout jako kolaterály, jako zajištění nových půjček. A tak to ten systém funguje. Jsou tu dvě rizika. Jedno, že banky ty dluhopisy nekoupí a pak, že Evropská banka se přizpůsobí v obtávce po půjčkách. Nicméně toto riziko se považuje za poměrně nízké, díky tomu, že euro je politický projekt. A jak jsme viděli, a to už jsme viděli už v minulosti, že Evropská centrální banka snížila svoje standardy týkající se kolaterálu a přizpůsobila se poptávce, takže můžete přinést, kolik chcete dluhopisů z Řecka, vládní dluho pisů z Řecka, protože jejich likvidita je neomezená, protože chtějí tento politický projekt zachránit. 
Ve své knize to dlouze vysvětluji. Vysvětluji také to, proč se jedná o politický projekt. Je to zásadní v tomto budu, abyste to pochopili. O těch pobítkách už víme od začátku eura. Chtěli si nížit tyto pobítky, aby nebyly vysoké deficity. Ale co vlády obvykle dělají při tragédii obecné pastviny, tak jenom regulují využívání zdrojů. Například pro rybáře se dají kvóty, kolik se může vylovit ryb. Myšlenkou bylo omezit deficity a využívání společného zdroje a kopní síly eura na 3 HDP. To byla ta kvota, ale nicméně nikdo to nějak nevynucoval, toto dodržování, protože tady není žádná vláda, která by dohlížela na ostatní vlády. To je jako kdyby si to říkali ty rybáři mezi sebou. A nikdo se o ně nestaral a nevynucoval. Mnohokrát tedy i Německo a Francie měly vyšší deficity než 3 A poté se rozhodli, že nebudou žádné pokuty nebo postihy. Protože se mohlo jednat o výjimečné podmínky. Za tím mechanismem tedy tragédie eura je nebo i je. To, co jsem právě uvedl. Nyní se podíváme na důsledky, jaké jsou pro soutěžící. Nyní se podíváme na konverzi úrokových sazeb. Když bylo jasné, kdo se přidá do eurozóny, jak tady vidíte, úrokové sazby za období tří měsíců, tady to je Německo, červená je Německo, A tu už bylo jasné, kdo se bude moc přidat k eurozóně a kdo ne. Tady to bylo 98. Tady ještě nebylo jasné, kdo se bude moc přidat do eurozóny. Z ty všechny úrokové sazby směřují někam k údajům Německa. Má to několik důvodů euro zaručuje jistou záchrannou penězi. Není zde cesta ven. Předpokládalo se, že bude trvat do nekonečna a že peněz mi zachrání země, které to budou potřebovat, jako je Itálie, Španělsko, Portugalsko a tak dále. Což se vlastně stalo. Druhým důvodem, proč úrokové sadzby byly tak nízké, bylo kvůli tomu, že očekávání inflaci byla nízká. Byla tady zaručení ECB, což trošku kopírovalo pozici v Bundesbanky, proto také symbolické ve Frankfurtu. Nyní vidíme, že Bundesbanka je nyní součástí té potápějící se lodi. Jaké jsou tedy důsledky těchto dvou důvodů? Tragédie, efekt tragédie eura a také tragédie týkající se těch úrokových sazeb. Můžete mít zisk z těch tohoto měnového přerozdělení, pokud máte vysoké deficity v jiných zemích. Můžete očekávat, že vás zachrání Především pokud jste malí, pokud jste moc velicí, aby se vás finančně zachránili, jako například Německo nebo Francie, potom z toho asi nebudete mít zisk z tohoto přerozdělení. Byly vyšší deficity a vyšší výdaje vlád v důsledku toho efektu tragédie eura. Bez eura by tyto země neměly tak vysoké deficity a tak vysoké výdaje, vládní výdaje. To bylo možné díky redistribuci. To umožnilo těmto zemím udržet si ekonomické struktury, které by jinak skolabovaly. Také jim to umožnilo udržet si neflexibilní pracovní trh. Obvykle by výsledkem byly vyso 
byla nezaměstnanost, ale euro tomu to pomohlo a důsledky tohoto neflexibilnímu trhu zastínilo euro. Například se používalo najímání do veřejného sektoru nebo předčasná penze. Také to pomohlo zlepšit zdravotnické a vzdělávací služby díky těmto vysokým deficitům. To také znamenalo na konci, že se snížila konkurenceschopnost. Je to také dáno těmi vysokými dluhy a také tím, že byly externalizovány alespoň do jisté míry na jiné státy eurozóny a státy mimo eurozónu. Tady vidíme nárůst vládních výdajů od roku 1999. Vidíme, že je to mezi 10 a 5 procenty většinou. Itálie je níž, protože Itálie, Itálie se připojila k euru, až když měla udržitelnou úroveň deficitu. Takže tam nedošlo k nárůstu, tam si to nemohli dovolit tolik navýšit výdaje, protože to byla příliš velká země. Pohybujeme se tedy mezi zhruba 5 až 10 procenty a tady se podíváme na srovnání. To jsou země z jádra eurozóny, Německo, Francie, Nizozemí, Rakousko, Finsko, a tedy je to spíš mezi 6 a 2 procenty, ten nárůst. Tyto uh, vládní výdaje, tento nárůst, neodpovídá přímo deficitu. Například uh, š, ve Španělsku nebo v Irsku se to neprojevilo takovým nárůstem deficitu. V těchto zemích došlo k boomu bydlení, takže tam byly obrovské vládní příjmy díky tomuto boomu a všechny tyto příjmy byly použity na vládní výdaje. I přesto díky tomu tedy nedošlo k takovému deficitu. Například ve Španělsku to ale byl neudržitelný vývoj. Španělsko se spolehalo na záchranu od ostatních budoucností. Musíme také vzít v úvahu rozdílné monetární a fiskální tradice v různých zemích. I to vysvětluje, proč v Německu vládní výdaje tolik nevzrostly. Tyto země, na tyto země měla monetární redistribuce negativní dopad od samého počátku. Na druhé straně mělo ovšem euro pro Německo velké výhody. Vzhledem k redistribuci uh, Německo sice tratilo, ale na druhé straně zde byly i výhody. Nárůst vládních výdajů se samozřejmě projevil v konkurenceschopnosti. Jak už jsem řekl, umožňuje to udržet neflexibilní trh práce a tak dále. Konkurence v zemích jádra eurozóny, tu vidíme tady v grafu, se zvýšila. Zejména tady v Německu, v Rakousku. Tady vidíme náklady na práci, to znamená, že když, když ta linka klesá, tak se vlastně konkurence zvyšuje. A tady máme země na periferii a tady došlo k obrovskému nárůstu 
nákladů na práci. Takže vidíme, že v eurozóně existuje rozdělení. Konkurence klesá. A naopak v některých zemích klesá a naopak v některých zemích se zvyšuje. Jsou to země, které profitují z přerozdělování. Toto vše se samozřejmě musí projevit i v obchodní bilanci těchto zemí. Nižší úrokové sazby na, perifi, na periferi, bublina a efekt přerozdělování a tragédie eura, to vše vedlo k boomu spotřeby na periferi. To umožnila právě monetární redistribuce. A výsledkem bylo, že periferie si vlastně žila nad poměry. Takhle to ale nemohlo pokračovat do nekonečna. Země na okraji eurozóny nemohly do nekonečna žít nad své poměry a V určitém okamžiku se zde objevily pochyby na trhu o tom, zda Německo bude mít schopnost, sílu a vůbec vůli a ochotu zachraňovat země z okraje eurozóny. Pak přišla finanční krize. A v tu chvíli uh, se na trhu objevily opravdu velké pochyby o tom, zda Německo bude ochotné ostatní zachraňovat. A začala krize. A ta krize je právě řízená celou touto dynamikou, těmi pochybami. Tady vidíme obchodní bilanci, kde se pohybuje nebo je ve stejném duchu. Tady máme Německo, Nizozemí, Lucembursko, Rakousko jsou v přebytku, Irsko také v přebytku a ostatní země jejich Evropy je v deficitu. Ty rozdíly se tedy ještě prohloubily. Čili v jádru eurozóny se zvýšila konkurenceschopnost a na periferii se naopak snížila. To je jasné vysvětlení tohoto rozdílného vývoje mezi dvěma skupinami zemí. A tragédie eura a vývoj uh, úrokové sazby neměly přímý vývoj na země vně eurozóny. Tyto země a jejich deficit jsou více ovlivněny domácí politikou a ne tolik tragedii eura. Tady máme srovnání. Tady je nárůst vládních výdajů v procentech v nečlenských státech. Tedy v zemích, které nejsou členy eurozóny. Pokud si vzpomínáte, tak na periferii to bylo okolo 6 až 10 a u zemí jádra eurozóny to bylo od 2 do 6 a tady je to ve prostřed, to znamená kolem těch 6 Je to tedy o něco nižší než nárůst na okraj eurozóny a poněkud vyšší než v zemích jádra eurozóny, což se dalo očekávat. V exportu obchodní bilance nevidíme také nic překvapivého. Vidíme, že je to víceméně stabilní. Až tedy na ten vývoj ve Spojeném království, tam je velká volatilita. 
ale jinak tu nevidíme nic zvláštního. A teď se dostáváme k otázce. Je dobrý nápad přijmout euro nebo ne pro vaši zemi, pokud by to bylo možné? Samozřejmě, že jsou zde pozitivní dopady ještě před vstupem do eurozóny. I když sfalšujete určité statistiky, abyste splnili maastrichtská kritéria. Příprava na vstup eurozóny znamená ve většině zemí nutnost provedení strukturálních změn. Ale jakmile do eurozóny vstoupíte, existuje zde velký tlak. Těžit tlak, těžit z tragedie eura je velice těžké odolat a nepohled, nepodlehnout té možnosti těžit z eurozóny navyšováním vládního deficitu. Samozřejmě si můžete říct, uděláme to jako řekové, budeme mít, vstoupíme do eurozóny, budeme mít vysoký deficit a pak nás ostatní zachrání. Ale z dlouhodobého hlediska by to znamenalo, že vaše ekonomika ztratí konkurenceschopnost a ztratíte svou nezávislost. Pokud tedy chcete mít nezávislost a udržitelný růst, udržet si konkurenceschopnou ekonomiku, tak raději do eurozóny nevstupujte. Samozřejmě jedna velká výhoda eura, na kterou vždy upozorňuje můj učitel de Soto, ten podporuje euro, asi protože Španěl, kdyby byl Němec, tak by byl proti euru, euru. A ten říká, že euro je dobré proto, že po přijetí eura už země nemůže devalvovat svou měnu. Takže je to vlastně druhá nejlepší možnost hned po zlatém standardu pro vaši měnovou politiku. Proč to tak je? Proč to, kde se to říká? Kde se to zažil devalvaci Španělů? španělské pesety na začátku 90. let a domnívá se, že v dnešní době, pokud by Španělsko stále mělo pesetu, pokusilo by se navýšit svou konkurenceschopnost devalvací, která spočívá v podstatě v tom, že okradete své občany tím, že devalvujete jejich měnu. Jak, jaká je moje reakce na tyto jeho námitky? První důvod, proč se ve Španělsku snížila konkurenceschopnost, je právě euro. Právě euro umožnilo navýšit deficit. A stejně tak k tomu bylo i v Řecku a v dalších zemích Jižní Evropy. Takže právě jednotná měna způsobila pokles konkurenceschopnosti. Euro také umožnilo těmto zemím nahromadit dluhy. Nebýt eura, tyto země by musely mnohem dříve přistoupit k reformám ve svém hospodářství. Španělsko by mnohem dříve muselo snížit vládní výdaje, muselo by přistoupit k reformám, jinak by došlo k obrovské inflaci. Tento tlak z vnějšku je také nebezpečný z dalšího důvodu. Je to proto, že se tím vytváří tlak na centralizaci, který už jsme zažili. Je to tlak na vytvoření fiskální unie, tlak na harmonizaci daňových sazeb. Například Irsku řekli, zachráníme vás, ale musíte zvýšit korporátní daně.
Takže zde existuje velký tlak na, směrem k centralizaci. A pak jsou to také euro dluhopisy. Když to schynu, tak v krátkodobém horizontu jsou zde výhody a přínosy, ale v dlouhodobém hledisku vlastně směřujeme touto strategii k evropskému superstátu. Když se podíváme na, především když se podíváme na historii evropské měny, co bych řekl na závěr? Připojením se do eurozóny vlastně se připojujete k systému perverzních pobídek. Vstup do eurozóny znamená navýšení deficitu, navýšení vládních výdajů a tím dochází ke snížení konkurenceschopnosti. Zvyšuje se také závislost na ostatních zemích, zemích a v dlouhodobém měřítku snížení hospodářského růstu. Kdybychom tedy nebrali v úvahu tyto pobítky, co je tedy na euro přitežlivé? Euro by mohlo být přitažlivé a přínosné pouze za podmínky, že dojde k několika zásadním reformám. Za prvé by se muselo zakázat, aby Evropská centrální banka nakupovala vládní dluhopisy nebo je přijímala jako kolaterály. A dále by se musela změnit filozofie Evropské centrální banky. Původně měla být Evropská centrální banka jakousi kopí Bundesbank, ale v dnešní době vidíme, že je to politický nástroj. Evropská centrální banka slouží jako politický nástroj, který má zachránit tento projekt eurozóny, takže celá ta filozofie banky by se musela změnit, aby se vrátila k Bundesbank. Děkuji vám za pozornost. I'd like to thank Dr. Bagus for his speech. And I'd like to invite to the floor our next speaker, Dr. Dr. Václav Rybáček from the Czech Statistical Office. Those who are standing in the back can use our front rows and to sit down and follow the next part of our conference. Václav, the floor is yours. Good afternoon. Welcome to the conference. In my speech, I would like to talk about uh, the. I, I'll support many conclusions by Philip Magus, Bagus, but from different perspective. Uh, it's based on empirical analysis of monetary conditions, upon uh, adoption of euros in various countries and groups of countries of the Eurozone, as well as in countries outside the Eurozone. I don't have that much time as Dr. Bagus, so I'll take it quickly. The influence of the adoption of the Euro on the monetary conditions is essential. It can be understood from the point of view, from the perspective of its influence or we can look at the short-term and long-term perspectives. Short-term can support economy 
or we can look at it from the long-term perspective. These influences can be long-term, uh, supporting economic growth or keep markets deviated. I'd like to talk about the short-term influence, which is generated by the adoption, by the conversion, by the change, by the conversion to nominal values. We have Germany here, which is very popular in this regard. But the similar experience was uh, in uh, different states as well, in Greece. The short-term influence of the euro was the following. Their purchasing power decreased. The reason was that the prices grew after the conversions to new prices in euros, while the nominal prices were converted quite well, to put it this way. What happened is that uh, the conversion decreased the real purchasing power of uh, the population and uh, there was a price war among chain stores. In Germany, the euro was called Teuro, but the official inflation remained stable, somewhere quite low. The reason was the difference between the perceived inflation and the real inflation. The perceived inflation is uh, the inflation perceived by consumers, and the real inflation is reflected by the real prices. The perceived inflation is perceived by the consumers and they are very sensitive to prices in stores. We can see that even though the official inflation was low, the perceived inflation was about triple the official one. So what happened is that people perceived euro as something that decreased their purchasing power and temporarily made them poorer. The situation got more or less the same after a certain period of time, after the war among chain stores stopped, even though the, infl when the inflation was low. In the segment of food, the prices grew quite a lot. The reason might be connected to the oil prices and it had been decreasing so the the while computing the price basket the the inflation was low this is the low was the short term influence uh, as far as uh, the long term perspective is concerned what is important is the influence of the euro on interest rates, as was already mentioned by the previous speaker. This is an important moment for any economic system. The logic is the following. The euro influenced the monetary conditions through interest rates. Uh, we analyzed new credits as interest rates influence uh, willingness to buy credits, to get credits. Uh, let's look at the development of real interest rates. After the creation of the Eurozone, there is a breaking point after the creation of the Eurozone concerning the interest rates for non-financial corporations. This is based on intermediate products prices. It is clear that there is a breaking point after the creation of the Eurozone. The interest rates went down. This might, be, this might look a bit confused, but uh, we can see that, uh, except for Spain, the tr tendency was the same in all the Euro countries. When there is a decrease of interest modes, it's a great in 
incentive to have debt. It can be understood as an impulse to have higher deficits. We've been talking about governing bonds and debts, but the question, another question is uh, consumers' debts, uh, private debts, which are quite high in many countries compared to government debts in many countries. We are talking about here about uh, non-financial corporations. What can be seen from these charts? Uh, the interest rates went down. Uh, non we are looking now at countries outside the Eurozone. The tendency is not that clear. And the development of interest rates follow the logic of a business cycle. It's rather cyclical. Let's look at uh, real interest rates for consumer loans and household credits and loans. Here the interest rates uh, follow the same pattern. After the creation of the Eurozone, so these interest rates decrease with the same impact on the motivation to get that. Compa again, compared to countries outside the Eurozone, except for the Great Britain, the pattern is that the development is more volatile compared to the Eurozone countries. These were the real interest rates that decreased after the creation of the Eurozone, whether there was an influence on the issue of Credits can be seen on the next chart about the new loans within the Eurozone. It is quite clear that the monetary conditions were softened and the environment for higher deficits were quite good. This development was broken by the financial crisis. In particular countries of the Eurozone, the development was quite volatile. The development in Germany is quite interesting. There is n no... We can't see too many more loans after the creation of the Eurozone. The development is quite stable compared to Spain. The impetus was there and the growth rate is quite high, about 10% per year. Again, this chart is a bit confusing, but this is the growth rate in various countries outside the Eurozone. This again, this is very volatile and it copies rather the business cycle compared to the situation in the Eurozone. The fact that there was a big growth of that, the, this fact had a great influence on financial institutions in the Eurozone because this and on their ability to face shocks. Uh, we have this leverage, leveraging a leveraging effect and we can see that the ratio between assets and banks capital is growing. Uh, in this chart you can see what's going on right now in the Eurozone, the the nominal GDP, GDP is below the total amount of money. There was great leverage in the Eurozone and it has been decreasing over the last month. The issue of new loans is not that high. Let's look at CPI and the development of inflation which is the final f stage of the analysis. 
the official analysis in the Eurozone was somewhere near 2%, which is the target, target inflation. The first chart is uh, France, Spain and Italy. Except for Spain, we can see that in these countries, France, Italy, Germany, there the inflation was close to the 2% to the required by the ECB. So the core countries had the inflation close to what the ECB demanded. But in other countries, it's not that clear. Mm, the development is not that stable as, for instance, in Germany. And it's much more, much higher in certain countries. The prices grew more quickly ever higher in other countries uh, than Germany. Let's look at the periphery countries. On the left, Greece, Portugal and Ireland. The inflation is much higher or relatively higher compared to, let's say, Germany or France. Again, the volatility is also higher. Uh, the Czech Republic uh, and uh, Central Europe, other Central European countries, uh, the situation is uh, more difficult is that the uh, Czech Republic is converting countries, so uh, we cannot compare too much here. Why the inflation was quite low, despite the fact that there was a huge issue of uh, loans. Issue of loans should have great impact on prices, but the CPI doesn't show that. CPI says that the inflation was quite stable. And what kept the, the inflation stable was uh, enormous import from China. And these were cheap goods. And these goods helped to keep uh, official inflation low, somewhere around uh, the demanded 2%. There was a rapid growth of the volume of money. Where are the money? As the consumer's basket include only consumer prices. I also included uh, production prices, which is an important segment in economy. The production, if you measure it, it's uh, much uh, bigger than the consumer sphere. We have to look at the, this segment. This is These are the prices of intermediate products and capital goods. It can be seen here that uh, the tendency was obvious with the, the volume of loans. After the creation of the Eurozone, there was a huge growth of uh, intermediate products prices, the products used in the production and which aren't included in the consumer's basket. Based on the analysis of this data, it can be said that uh, the money that were issued over the existence of the Eurozone's uh, are reflected rather in the production field than in the consumer prices that were lowered by the cheap in import from China. The prices of capital goods have uh, lower volatility. This is much. This is a general conclusion of the analysis. The interest rates uh, went down in the long term and the, the debts had been growing. If there are changes in prices in various countries, it has an influence on their competitiveness for how much they can export uh, into their partner countries. And if we take into account the export prices uh, from various countries, we can say that the development of prices was uh, better for the core countries, Germany, the red line, uh, as the, this is the low, lowest one in the chart. And uh, on the other hand, the 
the, in Greece where the export prices were quite high and they grew a lot which had an influence on the Greece competitiveness. My conclusions are that there was a long term decrease in real interest rates for consumer pr sphere as well as production. The money aggregates were increased which had an influence on financial stability for banks. Even though in the inflations, consumer inflation was somewhere around target percentage, the situation was uh, stable in the core countries such as Germany or France, but uh, the inflation, the prices of intermediate products grew. The consumer prices were stable thanks to China imports. If you tend to take into account uh, import prices, the situation worsened, the competitiveness of periphery countries worsened, uh, which can be just reflected in the deficits of these countries, and their competitiveness decreased, had decreased over the existence of the Eurozone. Based on the analysis of these monetary conditions, the creation of the Eurozone and the policy of the ECB show is uh, most beneficial for Germany, which has a great negotiating power. I think this is all from me. I'd like to thank you for your attention. And I hope that was not too many numbers for you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Rybacik. Thank you for respecting the time limit. And now I'll give the floor to Pavel Menarik from Severo Institute and maximum five, uh, 15 minutes, please. Thank you. I will try to make it shorter. I hope to leave some space for questions. My presentation is based on a simple reflection. If Euro is not just a political project, but I'm sorry, we don't have the sound anymore. If we look at the GDP growth in the Eurozone, it's uh, not bad. There was one bad uh, period of the economic crisis, but apart from that, GDP has been growing. However, it, if we compare the growth of GDP with other countries, uh, the situation is not very good in the Eurozone. If we compare it to the Central European countries like uh, the Czech Republic or other uh, countries that have undergone the transition, we can see uh, higher growth in these countries. But even uh, developed countries like Sweden or Switzerland these, even these countries have been growing faster than the Eurozone. This is true for the U.S. economy as well. There's one exception, Japan, but uh, Japan is facing uh, low growth uh, in the long term. Let's uh, look at the performance. 
Let's compare uh, the Eurozone to other countries. So with the exception of Japan, on average, uh, the non-Eurozone countries are doing as good or better than the Eurozone. When we look at the composition of uh, the GDP, we can see that in the Eurozone and in other countries, expenditure for consumption are quite stable. Fluctuations are caused especially by investment costs and foreign trade. As far as investments are concerned, there are not many differences between the Eurozone and the non-Eurozone countries. The biggest difference is that after the period around the year 2000, where investment was low. It was linked to the war in Iraq and terrorist attacks. So apart from this time, the Eurozone has begun a time of uh, constant growth. In uh, other countries, investment activity is more volatile sometimes it even decreases, which is not the case in the Eurozone. However, we cannot pretend that uh, the growth of investment activity is always a good thing and that this investment is always bad. If there are some bad investments, it's better that they are destroyed, that they are cancelled and that these uh, investments are used in a better way. Why uh, investments grew continually in the Eurozone? This can be explained by the monetary policy of the European Central Bank, and it can also be explained by the interest rates, which are, of course, mm, given by this policy of the ECB exportations. Uh, we could expect that the euro would uh, would support exportations and this has been the case. Export is growing. However, the impact is not the same in all countries. This was mentioned by uh, Mr. Bagos. The competitiveness diverges in different countries and the growth of uh, the capacity to export is uh, better in the countries that uh, increase competitiveness. On the other hand, in uh, other countries the impact will be very bad. Here we can see that some countries increase their shares on total export and on the other hand, other countries uh, decrease their capacity to export, especially in the countries in the periphery of the Eurozone. I'll come back to the business cycle in the Eurozone and in other countries. It is often discussed whether it is good that countries join the Eurozone uh, without uh, having harmonized their business cycle with the Eurozone. It seems that uh, all European countries and even countries outside of Europe have a similar business cycle. This means that the Euro doesn't make a lot of difference and second, this is not really a cause for worry. So let me conclude. The general comparison shows that the euro has not made much difference. 
Of course, we can ask what would have happened if there had not been the euro. But it seems that the, the development was similar in the eurozone and in the countries outside the eurozone. The euro has not encouraged economic growth substantially, and the euro has not prevented the, the negative impacts of the economic crisis. Uh, if there are any benefits of the eurozone, they are unevenly distributed, which was already mentioned by Dr. Bagus. Not all countries are winners, and especially poor countries on the periphery are not the winners of the situation. If we should uh, adopt policies to improve uh, international trade, I think there are better policies that exist that can enable us to achieve growth than the introduction of a common currency. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Pavel Minarik. And now I give the floor to Mr. Uh, Dr. Moimir Hampel, the Vice Governor of the Czech National Bank. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for uh, inviting me for this fascinating seminar. Uh, it is fascinating because even 50 minutes after the beginning of the seminar, new people still keep coming. So uh, I guess that people from the street can hear what is being said here, and they are interested, and they come inside. I am in a quite uh, comfortable position because uh, Papa told me to say whatever I want, but he also asked me to comment a bit on what has been said. I prepared some uh, pictures. I have uh, presentations, but I'm not going to use it because it's more interesting to react to what has been said. To put it simply, my presentation is about one macroeconomic macro thing, which has been repeated again and again in the Czech Republic. There is a convergence version of the impossible trinity. This means we are sure that it's not possible at one point to have a fast-growing economy that has a fixed interest rate and low um, imbalance. This is a very simple macroeconomic um, fact, and that's what I wanted to show in my presentation. It is confirmed by numbers in long term. That's why we are talking about all these impacts, a loss of competitiveness, divergence in growth of prices. This is due to the impossibility of the tr convergence trinity. So that's what you will not see. That was my presentation. And now my comments. Let me begin by what was said by Philip. I have to say that there is one technical point which is sometimes misunderstood. For me, the monetization of a debt does not mean that the ECB accepts uh, securities or bonds as collateral. To me, monetization means that the bank creates new money and then buys debts. I don't understand monetization as accepting uh, bonds as collateral. The, the bank must first have the, the means to buy the, the bonds. In other words, a central bank would be able to create inflation even if it did not accept uh, government bonds as collateral. It would even be able to create inflation if it did not accept any collateral. It can even uh, create inflation 
uh, if the bank does not add any liquidity but is only taking liquidity away from the market. What I want to say is that uh, what is accepted or not as collateral does not have an impact on whether the bank is achieving its uh, horrible inflation targets. This is true for Estonia as well, and Estonia has no government bonds. Uh, this was also the case in Slovakia. I think the problem is elsewhere. The problem is the artificial and unjustified regulatory setup of uh, zero risk for government bonds. This is a regulatory decision which was made by regulators, governments, and it, this says that the safest asset in the economy is the government bond. Why? Because we have decided it like this. Uh, this way, the securities, the, the government bonds, behave like that because it was decided. But that's uh, uh, another story. That's the regulatory setup of the balance. And that's not what I call monetization. This is the, the crowding out. This cannot be justified. This is uh, an unjustifiable setup of risk balance, and one type of uh, loans is replaced by another type, and this this is uh, a typical crowding out. What I call monetization is when the central bank uh, buys the government debt, but with new money, newly created money. So that was the first thing. I'd like to comment on that. Uh, a provocative comment, if it was, uh, Sir Philip said, I think that uh, those who save euro, those are trying to save euro, they, their argumentation wouldn't go that the biggest problem is that uh, direct monetization is not possible. It cannot be easily launched. And those who are trying to save the euro, they say this is the biggest barrier to save the project effectively. I must say that I agree with most of the things I heard here. Of course, the problem of the Eurozone was from the very beginning as institutionalized black passenger ship uh, as well as the tragedy of commons. I like the, this concept and mentioning the tragedy of commons. I'd like to comment on that uh, a bit later. The discussion about the euro has uh, been underway for a long time and it's very intense. Uh, it's unbelievable that in the Czech discussion on the euro, there are people who call themselves economists and who enter into the discussion saying that the level of real interest rates uh, is implied by, implied by the Euro program has no influence and have haven't had any influence on on the fact how the project looks like now. I like Tomasz Sedlacek. He's a great guy, and I'm sad he's not here today. But if an economist says that the price has no influence on the situation on on the way economic subjects behave and enter into debts uh, is desperate. Those who are trying to save the euro, these are the people who use, who think in this way and uh, it says a lot about the project itself. We've been talking about the rules of responsible economy. These rules cannot be enforced uh, in uh, this shared project. In the international law, when there is a group of friends who consider themselves friends, the idea of an easy way of enforcement to enforce a friend, to enforce a friend to behave in a way, this is impossible. It's contradictory to the logic of the world. 
if anyone believes that uh, five new treaties or pacts makes it easier to enforce laws and enforce obligations, I don't believe that. If a federal institution is shared by money, which is called ECB, and that issues uh, money and there is no someone on the top, this is impossible. It's unique in the history. And this idea of finding a mechanism of enforcement which is effective without sending tanks anywhere, it's absolutely illusory going against the logic of the problem. This is one of the reasons why during the financial crisis all the written rules and most of the written rules the project was based on were broken immediately. I'm talking about the two articles of the Lisbon Treaty. Yes, the must have happened, I would say. Philip said it quite exactly. I would like to add that he was right. The actors on the market expected from the very beginning that what has been stated in the paper that and uh, These breaks will not function the first moment there is a crisis. The market is a contingent liability of Germany and the, these who said that were right. The reality, the market expectations were, were right and uh, it was more right than the treaty. You shouldn't be surprised by that. and. It's quite understandable for all of you who study at this institute. Yes, black passengers, not, not even that, that, that it did not accelerate the mechanism. You might have heard about that. The black passengers and passenger ship put pressure on the structure reforms. Why should you, why should the government in Greece should try to to do anything if the situation as it is is much easier. There is no reason to make any reforms, any important reforms, because it's very difficult to do structural reforms. Even though the government is in a situation where there is no one normal, no one is willing to no one, no one normally is willing to lend. No one can expect that. The unsupportable policies cannot be financed this way. My colleague, my all my colleagues were right. This will not be quite correct, politically correct. Germans were not right. The, when the when they created pan-European uh, public good out of uh, their marker, and they allowed all the Europe to use this the credibility credibility of marker was provided to the rest of the eurozone. And this was a German decision which will have consequences in the future. And yes, I agree with the fact that, with uh, the statement that this will lead to economical consequences that will not be very agreeable into fiscal transfers. I don't agree with Philip in that, as uh, I could read in the paper, I don't agree with uh, the fact that the transfers will have to be more transparent. I don't agree with that. I think that for to keep 
the hole more compact and to make it survive the transfer will have to be to a certain extent not transparent less transparent than now you you won't be able to say we take this money and send it to another country this will not work this political and economical argument uh, can go further the Germany has a dilemma which I call a dilemma to choose a good currency in the future or to continue this way because up till now up till the crisis of the eurozone it seemed that both these things Germany can have at the same time per parallelly and that uh, one doesn't put into danger the other one I think this uh, is not true either explicitly or rather implicitly Germany has to choose where it wants to have uh, the currency which was to be called uh, pan-european marker but it will rather be a peseta a bit or whether it will want to continue the project of integration i think germany will choose integration which is the answer to the question how attractive the currency will be for the, the new potential countries that would join the eurozone structural reforms were mentioned uh, several comments on that, uh, on uh, convergence of interest rates. It has to be said that in certain countries, uh, thanks to the fact that there is a system of floating exchange rate, there, long time ago, the nominal interest rates convert to the average of the eurozone and they even fell below the eurozone one of the countries is the Czech Republic this is a short comment to on uh, what Philip said I hope we all agree on that the euro as a concept has nothing to in common with a gold standard uh, I think this should be said here it's not a comment on anyone here. I, I just wanted to add it. These are concepts that are quite different because the concept of the euro is a concept of currency where the which is quite voluntary. Even I, I remember that uh, El Menso said a great sentence when he was trying to describe uh, the concept of euro why the concept of ECB is uh, good he said uh, you know it's nice that compared to the United States in Europe uh, in the eurozone it works uh, that compared to the Fed there is there is no government that's what we would like Malta didn't think about one thing there, there is one central bank and 17 governments this model can have negative consequences I agree with uh, the analysis of perceived inflation presented by Mr. Ibacek the problem even though there are many that many have presented in a way that the biggest problem of the euro is uh, the price shock uh, at the moment of the adoption and how to prevent that the perceived inflation and how to work with these problems I think it's different this is not a problem at all this is a political problem this is not a real problem what is a problem are the long-term tendencies that have been described in a nice way uh, I totally agree with that the 
the last comment. Whatever we think about the concept of uh, the euro, I think it is sure that the concept and this way of thinking around us, near to us, will be existing. So I think these semin seminars of this kind are very useful, no matter what the situation in the Eurozone is, and there is nothing worse than no discussion and taking things for granted. Because the concept of the Eurozone show what it can cause when we take things for granted and do not think about it. That is all from me. And I suppose there might be any, some comments from my colleagues. Thank you, Moimir Hempel. And now I open the floor for questions. Please uh, wait for the microphone if you want to ask a question. Then introduce yourself. You can ask a question, you can comment, you can criticize. We have uh, 30 minutes for questions. Hello, my name is Petr Adrian. I am from the Academy. Uh, Mr. Silacic has never said that he was an economist. That's a defamation. Uh, I wanted to speak about the second half of the 90s. I was in the Institute for European Integration at the University of Economics in Prague. And uh, there was a discussion about the pact uh, on growth and stability, and uh, I was uh, fired from the, this institute after my discussion. The, the result of this discussion was a publication which was called uh, A Costly Preparation for the Titanic. The, what I said was that a common currency In this framework, uh, that is to try to save the southern part countries, and on the other hand, there was the valuation of the currencies of the northern countries. There was a, a clash, and I said that this would lead to the situation of divergence which we are uh, seeing now. There would be a loss of competitiveness, loss in uh, export capacity, increase in deficit, and it would lead to a big moral, social, and economical crisis. The background uh, motive to maintain this was uh, for Germany to maintain uh, good export capacity. I think all panelists have confirmed this. In uh, 1999 and 2000, we said that this would last maximum 10 to 15 years. And we were wondering how come that Jacques Delors and other people in Brussels do not know this? For us, to, for us, it was a simple reflection, and up to today, we haven't understood why uh, the the politicians did not know about this. The Maastricht summit lasted from December to February of the next year, and it worked with a. Uh, so-called moral hazard, something that would damage the whole European continent for a long time. We are asking how is it possible that the European political elites have allowed for such a, a huge moral damage? 
this is the big problem the the moral the ethical dimension of the problem this is a big uh, negative impact which will uh, last for generations now uh, who would like to react from the panel they knew it This uh, was mentioned in all debates in uh, Germany, for example. That's not the problem. There is a book called Ideas Have Their Consequences. And uh, the fact is that uh, different ideas are winning and these different ideas have different consequences. That's 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 it. Another reaction, Philip. Ano. Souhlasím, oni to věděli. Já ve své knize píšu, že oni to vlastně chtěli. Prvním cílem bylo zbavit se Bundesbank a německé marky. A cílem bylo využít německou měnovou politiku a financovat ostatní země, také věděli, že to zahájí tendenci k centralizaci. A já tvrdím, že oni to věděli a přesně tohle chtěli. A ještě jsem chtěl mít tady jednu poznámku o exportu. Vy jste říkal, že malé periferní země na tom budou tratit, a já si myslím, že je to vlastně naopak. Když máte přebytek do vozu, tak vlastně vítězíte, protože dostáváte něco zadarmo. Představte si, že prodáte svůj majetek, tak to je, když exportujete, když si necháte, když si necháte ostříhat, nebo když si koupíte jídlo, tak importujete. A kdybyste se mohli rozhodnout, chce, chcete jenom importovat nebo jenom exportovat, tak bych řekl, chci jenom importovat. A to je přesně to, co udělali ty země na okraji. Jejich dovoz byl mnohem vyšší než vývoz. Takže já si myslím, že euro nemá největší přínos pro obyčejného Němce, ale pro země na okraji eurozóny. Já sám žiji na okraji eurozóny, takže já mám vlastně z eura prospěch. Takže já osobně bych rozhodně z návratu k německé marce neprofitoval. Thank you very much. Uh, any other comments? Jaromír Miškovský, Cevro Institute. If the balance ratios dictated by Basel II were cancelled and if ECB had a, a limit of 2%, if we used the autopilot, would it be possible to maintain the euro? And the second question is, what would you do as a, an absolute sovereign of uh, Greece? Would you leave the euro and uh, issue drachma? As I said, I think the the essential problem of the euro is not the in the technicalities of the monetary policies and the inflation target. The problem is structural, institutional. The the precise uh, technical way it is done and the policy is not very important. I can imagine that uh, the central bank accepts collateral 
um, cor corporate bonds, for example. But I think this won't change anything on the structural level, which it will not change the concept itself. The second question. There are a few uh, fantasies that are as little attractive as being a dictator in Greece. I have no idea. Já bych se zabýval vládním dluhem, čili bych zachoval euro. Taky bych vydal drachmu. Řecko by se muselo reformovat. Už by, se, už by Řecko nemohlo žít z toho, že mu ostatní pomáhají. Tohle by se mělo udělat. A banky by zaplatily za financování a ne nevinní plátci daní. Chtěl bych ještě reagovat na něco, co jste řekl o té monetarizaci. Z ekonomického hlediska si myslím, že nezáleží na tom, jestli vy produkujete více peněz a koupíte vládní dluhopisy, a nebo jestli vy produkujete více peněz a přijmete vládní dluhopisy jako kolaterál. Jediný rozdíl je právní. A to, že v jednom případě jsou banky stále vlastníky těch dluhopisů, v druhém případě nikoli. Ale v obou případech dojde k navýšení oběživa. To znamená, že není důvod nazývat jeden případ monetarizací a druhý nikoli. Důležitá je ovšem délka toho úvěru. A teď už, je to, už jsou to tři roky třeba deset let nebo sto let. Vypadá to... Vlastně, když se ta doba úvěru takhle prodlouží, tak je to už téměř jako kdyby banky ty dlouho by si odkoupily. Je pravda, že pro banky je bezpečnější ty dlouho by si odkoupit, protože musí pak snížit úrokové sazby. Protože existují, existuje riziko. Samozřejmě, když, když Evropská centrální banka ty dluhopisy odkoupí, tak je to pro trh bezpečnější. Když by, kdyby Evropská centrální banka řekla, že odkoupí jakékoliv množství dluhopisů, pak. Vlastně o to už se tak trochu snaží. Znamenalo by to pro banky neomezenou likviditu po tři roky. Nesouhlasím s vámi v tom, že nezáleží na tom, co je přijímáno jako kolaterál. Pokud by řecké dluhopisy nebyly přijímány jako kolaterál, tak by zítra Řecko zbankrotovalo. A stejně tak mnoho evropských bank. Myslím si, že to, co je přijímáno jako kolaterál, je velice důležité. Důležité je i důvěra trhu v euro. Myslím si tedy, že na tom záleží. Uh, I will ask uh, Moimi Rampel to uh, for a short comment. This is uh, first of all, I agree with Philip. The default topic, the default of uh, the Greece. 
If the default was done, uh, I think there is already a default uh, from the economic perspective, at least uh, at the moment where the maturity wa was postponed for two times uh, by uh, international creditors. This, from the economical point of view, is a default. We just don't want to say it. We don't want to, to call it default. We f look for new terms like restructuring, etc. But this has already been default. I understand that Philip would be that courageous that he would only call it the right name. I accept this. Um, the the two other things, collateral and uh, collateral of quality, I want to say that what is uh, a collateral of high quality and of no quality from the point of view of regulator, regulation is uh, a decision of the state. This is not supported by any logic. This is uh, been the decision of the state. What could de develop in the market into a collateral of high quality must not be necessarily defined by a default of, uh, of quality by the central bank. For myself, I say that if uh, the decision would have, if the decision was done that the corporate bonds are the holders of the highest quality, I think from the point of view the things are done, nothing has to change. And concerning the monetization, the central bank would be able to create inflation. 2, 3 or 10 percent, even if there was no government bond in economy. This is not necessary for the central bank to be able to reach its inflation target. It doesn't need any government bonds. That's why I mentioned Estonia, where the debt is so low that it wasn't able to compute the interest rate based on master criteria because it has no bonds of this kind. This is a different case with the Czech Republic, but the central bank was able to reach inflation. This is not a condition, but uh, there should be a technical discussion. We should have sometime in the future and talk about monetization when it starts and when it ends and uh, what are the different techniques and its consequences. Another question, comments, please. Vita Kedlička, Reform CZ. My question is the following. The euro was a means to reach uh, close European integration. And the fact is that the, the it was not secret. This was not secret. What uh, that the S ESM, which is something uh, that was adopted by the Slovak government, they want to have it before the elections, or the fiscal government of the European Un Union, or the fiscal international fund. What do you think is the most important? of these threats or what could what else could come as a threat what else thank you anyone from the panelists as far as the treaties are concerned that should learn us to save money i think the european is the union is the last one to teach this they have no idea how to do that The GDP of the Czech Republic is uh, more or less the same amount that uh, is the amount that is needed for the European Union to function. And this Germany had problems itself to keep the mastery criteria and it started to enforce uh, the criteria less. So. This is mutual. It's not mutually enforceable. I think 
there can be no treaty saying save money. We are just getting back that there is uh, no one who would enforce uh, the criteria. There has been an effort to put the European Union on this position, but it will only be an authority that will face 25 or so countries, and it cannot send tanks anywhere or to enforce all that. Do you remember the discussions at the beginning when the euro was adopted or created? One of the reasons why the euro was introduced is that th there was a monetary hegemony in Germany, in Europe. It's one of the countries without which uh, there can be no monetary integration. Without any other country, the monetary integration is possible, not without Germany. And this jealousy of all other countries on the role of the hegemony country was one of the reasons why the euro was created. Today, after talking to German colleagues, they are frustrated. When we are voting in the ECB Council, we have the, our vote has the same weight as the Maltese vote. The hegemony could return, but not as euro. It would have to be something similar to German marker. This, it would be a structure where the hegemony would be respected by other countries. That's how the German marker functioned before the creation of uh, the eurozone. Marka was respected by its immediate surroundings, by Austria, by the countries of Benelux. Long before the creation of Euro, these countries gave up on creating monetary conditions in their own countries and they f their currencies were fixated on the Euro or fixed. And this was a spontaneous reaction to the market. Euro is not spontaneous. This is an effort that makes create the tragedy of commons where uh, sources are overexploited and uh, there are no limits. This is the reason why the concept will be in trouble and will face trouble they are facing now. Philip is German, so. Jaká je otázka? Já s vámi souhlasím. S, naprosto souhlasím s vaším hodnocením. Říká se tom, říkal se tomu tyranie Bundesbanky, také jaderná zbraň Německa a také to bylo cílem Francie zbavit se této jaderné zbraně. A po pádu berlínské zdi Je, bylo potřeba povolení, aby se mohlo Německo spolu sjednotit, aby mohlo být znovu silné. A tak podmínkou bylo obětovat německou marku, aby se mohlo spolu sjednotit Německo. A stalo se to, co jste řekli. Němci mají jeden hlas, malťané také. Co můžeme dělat? Thank you. I would like to suggest to continue this, this, this discussion over a glass of wine. I would like to thank you all for participation. I would like to thank the speakers for their speeches and for the discussion. I hope that Twitter was overwhelmed by statements on the internet and that can contribute to the good name of our school. To those of you who came, I would like to remind that uh, today's presentations will be published in a book, the first of our edition policy series. This book, as well as our today's conference, was supported by the Alliance of European Reformists and Conservatives. I would like to thank to this alliance this way. And those of you who like to come to join us, I would like to inform you that 
Soon we will have, uh, on the 23rd of February, we will have uh, academic forum of several on an Italian scholar on the 3rd. We also have Professor Schmitz from Arizona University on the topic of Hayek and Justice. I'd like to thank you all for your participation again, and uh, I'd like to invite you to informal discussion over a glass of wine. Thank you. Hope to see you again. A připomínám, máme tady autora knihy Tragédie Eura, velmi rád podepíše. The author will be happy to sign his book.